Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Fancy Ice 17 and I'll be your YouTuber today. So today we're going to be looking at the Clement Voroshilov uh, series of tanks. Uh, very, very interesting tanks developed by Russia in 1939 all the way through, uh, you know, the end of World War II. Uh, so obviously today I'm on my EU account. It's considered a re-roll because I had to make an EU account to really... Uh, to acquire this tank i've had this account before which is why you'll see different premiums on it uh so i am facing bots so don't worry about the damage it was just me trying to get some gameplay so uh this tank was named after the people's defense commissar uh or aka the commissioner as we call them and the political statesman clement Voroshilov. uh it was originally not intended for serial production uh this tank was uh ended up being made after the uh, SMK, which it was a super heavy tank in 1939, uh, which underwent testing and was proven unreliable and was replaced by the KV-1 series. This tank series was approved by Stalin himself, which is why, you know, I said that it wasn't originally meant for serial production until it was approved by him. So our variants in 1939... They pumped out their first 50 uh, pre-series production tanks, and they were virtually identical to each other. And other than some different hull changes for uh, ease of production, these tanks were similar. They borrowed the torsion bar, the chassis from the SMK design, which uh, they also adopted the inferior engine, which was eventually replaced with a trustier engine, which was the model v1 600 horsepower at 2000 rpm um, which was assembled in the kirov factory i'm sorry if i'm butchering uh russian i'm not russian i'm obviously american uh but back to what we were talking about uh the protection on this vehicle was superior for its time the frontal glacius in the turret was 90 millimeters which was very rare at that time. Uh, comparative tanks to this would be the Matilda II that the British used, which was 80 millimeters, and the French B1 Bis, which was 70 millimeters. Uh, in 1939, these tanks were originally meant to carry the 76.2 millimeter F32 cannon, which was intended to be used, but due to the delays required to production, the use of a medium velocity short barreled L11 gun was used on these tanks instead. Uh, very, very strong tank. Like I said, it was very ahead in German standpoint. Germany did not have the tanks required to deal with these at the time, which is what made them so good. So these were considered the KV-1s. So the KV-1A ended up being the tank that they titled with the original cannon that it was supposed to have, which was the F-32 76.2 millimeter. Uh, the KV-1A also had the improved mantlet, which uh, you know changed the way the turret was able to you know house the gun. Uh, so we're going to get into some different variants of this tank. Uh, so the KV-1E, those of you who've played War Thunder are very well aware of this tank, if not. So these tanks were basically KV-1 originals, then the ones from 1939. Uh, they ended up needing some heavy, heavy uh, redoing and because, you know, they were getting later in the war. Germany was starting to get better guns. They were facing stronger armor. So the KV-1Es were refitted with these widescreen 20 millimeter soft steel plates. Um, and they, they basically just took really huge bolts, slapped them on the sides of the turret, the front of the turret, and the frontal glacius. And it, it was crazy strong. And like I said, they were mainly comprised of the 1939 models or the 1940s that needed kind of retired. The number of these that were quote unquote produced is really unknown. Uh, there's no uh, stated record of it. Uh, it's between 150 and 200 plus. We really don't know that number. And getting into the tank improvements of the KV-1 series. 
Uh, the KV-1B was the 1941 model. The KV-1C was the 1942 model. Um, and then we get into the weirder models that people uh, started you know, designing. They wanted different tanks for different roles. And then you have the KV-1 Skorovtanov or Tanoi or whatever the fuck. I can't speak Russian. Sorry, that's the KV-1S. Uh, so basically that meant KV-1 speed. They wanted a fast tank. Uh, you know, crazy outreaching designs. And then we have the KV-85, which also coined the blueprint for the original IS-1 model. Uh, really, really fun. Uh, then we get into the big chungus, the KV-2 artillery tank. So these were bunker buster tanks meant to take out infantry encampments and bunkers. Uh, it was a 152 millimeter howitzer and a lot of people think these tanks were amazing but there was so many problems with these tanks in real life uh the gun itself when it fired it was prone to shaking the engine and transmission and causing interior damage to the tank it, it was as tall as a barn so it was very easy to spot and the turret was top heavy so you were prone to have you know even more interior issues i think there's a couple images of a kv2 actually on its side like the whole thing just toppled over uh, i'd have to find one and then you have really weird variants like the kv8 which was a flamethrower tank they basically just mounted a flamethrower on a kv chassis and said whoo that's great and there was a couple models i think it was the at01 and the at02 uh, i'd have to go back and look at it i didn't put that in my notes and then, you know, we have the SU-152 self-propelled gun. Um, that was a very interesting tank. Uh, everyone knows it. It's the Casemate uh, Tank Destroyer Tier 7 here. Really interesting tanks, in my opinion. And there was actually previous models, uh, prototypes, to, so to speak, of the U-18. I forget the object number for it. Uh, so every, every uh, Russian tank when it was going into prototype stage and or was entering serial production had an object and then a number assigned to it um so the tank we're using right now is the kv220 and the original model didn't have the appropriate turret so it was mounted with a kv1 turret with a diamond mantlet and it was renamed the 222 and that's why it gets its name uh, we get into the KV-13. One of these were actually built. It was the quote-unquote universal medium tank. And it was kind of their step up between needing, you know, not as much armor, but mobility. They wanted mobility for their tanks, and that was seen as the universal tank. The only service history I know about for the uh, KV-222, it did see service in 1945 and it was destroyed on its first battle and the original turret for it was used as a fixed turret location for uh entrenchment for russians uh the turret cannot be found crazy the thing just got knocked out immediately on its first battle but that kind of comes into this thing's playstyle and the kv1 playstyle in general that you'll see with your kv1s your kv3 your kv4 even your kv5 you can rely on your armor to an extent, but people are just going to go right through you sometimes, especially when they start loading gold rounds. Uh, you want to utilize your very strong sprocket wheels, your turret side armor. That's really, really where you get your strength is side scraping. Without side scraping, you're basically just telling everyone, hey, shoot me right through my driver port, please. I want you to knock my tank out of battle. And obviously, going against bots here, I got a mastery on my fourth or fifth game in this tank. Yeah. It's, it's stupid. I don't like the bot matchmaking. Maybe it's good for certain players, but it's not for me. It's basically setting people up to fail. And uh, I did I did buy the uh, lucky container, the, the big one, that gave me one of every box. Lucky containers for me, they're a hit or miss. You can either spend the fucking $20 or whatever it is for a tier 7 bucks 
and get the worst tier 7. Or you can do get the worst tier 8. In my opinion, you get the T-54 prototype. It fucking sucks now. It's, it's so much power creeping that it's not worth it, in my opinion. Uh, lucky containers, if you have the extra cash, go for it. If you don't, please do not buy these. Uh, you can Your RNG has to be fantastic. But that, that's kind of my rant for that. And I'm glad that you guys stayed till the end. You know, I really appreciate all the support you guys have given me. You know, my Patreon's now live, and so is my Discord. And I just want you all to have a fantastic day. Stay cool, stay frosty, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you very much for staying till the end.